although the disciples had no idea what was about to happen, they knew that something was happening. Jesus' words were filled with a particular heaviness. He spoke of one of the twelve betraying him. They all began to question, is it me? He spoke of Peter denying him. He talked about how he would be leaving them, even dying. Did P Peter feel this great weight of concern resting on his heart, uncertainty? But for all the somberness of that moment, Jesus remained resolute and his face was set like flint to the tasks that were right before him, that were unfolding around them. And so did Peter, saying, I'll do anything. I will follow you even to death. By the time they left the upper room, though, it was quite late. After all, the Passover Seder meal only begins uh, after sundown and Tonight in Israel, that's at 7.01, and dinner only just began 20 minutes ago. There are so many elements in that Seder meal that it would not be uncommon for an Orthodox Jew to go well beyond midnight celebrating the Passover. One required element during the Seder meal are four glasses of wine taken throughout the course of the meal. And in addition to all of the elements of Seder, the, the Gospel of John gives us five additional chapters of content that Jesus was infusing into this meal. So you know it went for a long time. It was an hour that was usually reserved for sleeping. But here they were, walking out of Jerusalem, heading once more to the Mount of Olives, and they knew why. This is where Jesus liked to go to pray. And they knew that their night was far from over. And so what I want to do tonight is bring those moments to bear on our lives right now. I'm going to read to you from the Gospel of Matthew about what happened next. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And this is Matthew 26, now in verse 38. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Father, as we consider these words tonight, I pray that you would transport us there to see our Savior weeping and praying to see the disciples sleeping, to see the whole created order teetering on that moment, and fill our hearts with inexpressible joy 
for what transpired. I pray in Christ's name. So Jesus takes the disciples into Gethsemane on the flanks of Mount Olives, to, the Mount of Olives, to pray. And shortly after entering, he leaves behind eight of the disciples and, and likely a whole bunch more that were with him that night, not mentioned in the Gospels. Going deeper into the garden, further up the hill, he takes with him Peter, James, and John. I imagine that as, as soon as they were out of sight, no longer seen by the other disciples, Jesus' countenance changes. That flint face cracks. And in that moment, Peter sees something that he's never seen before. The Messiah, racked with sorrow. And then asking Peter, James, and John to pray, Jesus walks just a little farther, a stone's throw, it says, and he falls on his face, and he's weeping, and he's praying so loud that they can hear him. Imagine how troubling this would have been to witness. Would Peter have remembered the lake that he fished his whole life, storming so furious, thinking he was about to die, and there's Jesus, sleeping. How about the time where Jesus unflinchingly reaches out and he touches the leper, something no Jew would dare do, touch an unclean person like this? Or just a few days ago, would Peter remember when Jesus stands up and publicly rebukes the most powerful religious leaders in all Judea? This same Jesus courageous and fearless and incomprehensible, incomprehensibly powerful, says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. There he is, weeping, face down in the dirt, in a place darker than Peter has ever seen him, in a place darker than Peter even knows right now. I imagine that everything in Peter was stirring in that moment, wanting to be there for his Savior. And if Jesus wanted him to pray, then he will pray. He will pray his heart out. And like he said earlier that night, he'll do anything for Jesus, even if it's his own life. And Jesus wanted them to see this battle that he was engaging in, that he was walking in, knowing full well what was happening. He wanted them to strive with him in prayer, like brothers at arms. These three... We love so much their prayers would be a comfort to him in time of unbearable need. But Jesus just kept praying like this. And it was so late. And they had their four glasses of wine, if not more. And I think we all know that sorrow can be exhausting. And Peter's fight against sleep was a short one. Three times, three times this happens. Three times did, does Jesus spill tears in prayer, and three times does he return to Peter, James, and John, and there they are asleep again. And I can't help but think that we are Peter. And when he should have been praying, found himself sleeping. Is not the flesh weak? Most of us have probably fallen asleep when trying to pray, and I know I have. And then when we're trying to sleep, maybe we find ourselves scrolling on our phone. When we want to meditate on Scripture, there we are thinking about how to reorganize the room or the tasks that I need to do that day or anything but the Scripture. When we want to cut caloric intake, all we want is sugary junk. When we want to be diligent about discipling others, we revert to those re comfortable relational patterns. We want to feel joy in Christ, but we can't shake the darkness in our own hearts. And there are countless, countless other self-contradictions like these. We are not who we want to be, who we know we should be. The good we want to do, we fail to do it. And the evil we don't want to do, that's what we end up doing. And with exasperation, 
of this same self-contradiction, Paul cries out, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of flesh? Personally, when I am tired, I almost never have the strength to slay sleep. If there's one thing that I know and that my life has taught me, I am completely incapable of delivering myself, even from sleep. And yet even here, though I know that, I try to deliver myself from this body of flesh. Wretched man that I am. Meanwhile, as Peter loses his battle with sleep, as I know I would, there's Jesus. There's Jesus on a battlefield that Peter can't even comprehend. This cup that is set before him brims with the Father's wrath. Who can deliver Peter from this body of death? Who can deliver me from this body of death? Jesus, as he lays down his body unto death. And he will drink from that cup full of God's wrath, facing physical torment, bodily anguish that you or I cannot even fathom, but far more agonizing than that, and assuredly why Jesus is so weeping, weeping so, so desperately that his tears are turning, or his sweat is turning to blood, as Luke tells us, is because he was about to be utterly condemned and despised by the Father as he was clothed in all the sins of the elect. A liar, sexually immoral, arrogant, a gossip, a rebel, selfish, a hypocrite, a bigot, a murder, and everything else that God hates. Jesus, the most beloved son, was becoming. And when the father turns his back on the son, the darkness of hell sets upon him. The universe would never see an agony greater than the father forsaking the son. Just the thought of it puts Jesus on his face, turns his sweat to blood. Jesus is limited feeble human nature is on the verge of collapse here. I don't know if you realize that. On the verge of collapse, about to be swallowed up by the very cup that he is supposed to drink. And he cries out, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Through Luke's account, it's possible to deduce that at this point, the father answers his son's prayer in the form of an angel. And where Jesus was about to buckle under the weight of what was to come, the father sends an angel to strengthen him. And perhaps, I think, and this is speculation, that in that moment, the angel also assures Jesus there is no other way. This is the way. I think so because of how Jesus' pray, prayer changes from that first time to the second. And the second time he prays, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So in that statement, you see all questions of the course ahead being removed and the inevitability of the moment coming upon Jesus. He's no longer praying for the cup to be passed or removed. He's now praying for success in the drinking of it. That at its bitter taste he would not buckle and that his flesh would not waver. His prayer is for success in drinking the wrath of God. In this moment, just before 
the pinnacle of human and divine agony, the universe witnesses the zenith of of obedience, human and divine. Nothing like this has ever happened nor will ever happen in all history. And there it is, the most beautiful, most powerful moment of obedience in all history. And there's Peter sleeping through most of it. The disparity between the believing sinner and the faithful Savior was perhaps never so stark as when Jesus prayed And Peter snored. The whole cosmic order was teetering, if only for a moment. Peter gave in to a feeble temptation while Jesus faced the final temptation that would have swallowed whole worlds of men. But rising from that dirty ground, he stands resolute, prepared for the cross, prepared for the Father's condemnation, prepared for that brimming cup of wrath. And he says, after finding the disciples sleeping once more, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. That moment, those words should be so precious to us. None of us, not one of us here would have fared better than Peter. And I know that I wouldn't have because I know that I am weak. But right there, right where we are so utterly unable and feeble and unfaithful, Jesus is resolutely faithful. And when he says, let us be going, he knows right where he is going. The disciples have no idea. He knows. In a matter of hours, he would be dead. The only way that Peter was ever able to understand that moment, that night, was to see a tomb empty. To watch him ascending into heaven and to receive the Holy Spirit. And only when he understood the whole picture was he really able to understand what happened in Gethsemane. Only when, only then would he be able <laughs> to match his claims. Peter would indeed follow Jesus to the point of death. It would only be decades later and in Rome where he was crucified upside down because he felt it too unworthy to be crucified like his savior. Only after Pentecost would would Peter's self-contradiction begin to dissolve. And I bet that he spent many many long nights praying, reflecting on Gethsemane while others slept. Who will deliver us from this body of death? The one who drank the cup. For our death was killed when his body died. This life is much like the unsticking of Velcro. We're pulling it apart a little bit at a time, separating who we are in Christ with the body of death, this fleshly self, bit by bit. But on that day, When we, like our Savior, rise from the grave, the sinful flesh will be forever separated from us and forever stay dead in the grave as we rise perfected and righteous and free. So fear not, brothers and sisters, though we sleep, Jesus remains faithful. And when he finds us sleeping, which is all too often, he does not return 
condemnation to us. But he asks us to follow him further. We don't know where he's going, but he does. And so with weak flesh, with willing spirits, let us follow Jesus who drank every last drop of the wrath of God so that none of us here would have to. Jesus gives us another cup instead to drink. A cup not filled with wrath, a cup filled with forgiveness. And he removes from us the body of death to give to us his righteous body, abounding in life eternal, symbolized in the bread that we are about to partake in. So what we're going to do for the next five to ten minutes is gather together in, in little groups, as big or small as you desire, and as you feel comfortable. And this is not a time to share prayer requests. It's a time to reflect on that night in Gethsemane, the obedience of Jesus that was resolved there, the great price that was paid so that you and I could have life. So as you pray, reflect on these things. Ask him to help you and each other stay awake. And as you pray, praise him.